Welcome back, and thanks again for joining us for our uh, Bible study here at The Journey about the beauty of the body and the beautiful truth that we are the body of Christ. Today we're on Lesson 6. Uh, it's about movement and, uh, and how the body needs to move. Uh, we're going to uh, have a few more lessons. We're going through nine lessons, so this is Lesson 6 as we uh, begin to head into the home stretch and look at some of the things that the body is supposed to be doing uh, we've looked at how we function together and now how do we move into a world uh, that needs Jesus and that's what he has asked the body of Christ to do. So as we get started, let me pray with you and uh, we'll just ask God to open our hearts and open our minds as we uh, look into his word. Lord Jesus, uh, we're thankful for the wisdom in which you have put us together in the way in which our minds and our hands and our feet and our skin and our heart, it all works together. And we're thankful that you've taken that same wisdom in the creation of this physical body and you've applied it to the makeup of the church. And so we're thankful that we can work together uh, with believers and we pray that we will do it effectively to move the gospel of Jesus Christ into this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Movement. We got to have it. Aren't we thankful for it? Dr. Brand, as we... Uh, are looking at the book Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Uh, last week we talked about bones and the necessity of bones and how we can't move without them. We're going to review that in just a second. And as he finishes that thought, he says, bones serve the body, they do not dominate. Uh, and most of us may not ever see a bone, um, at least hopefully not our own, right? Uh, so bones serve the body, they do not dominate. God's law serves us. It does not domineer over us. Uh, and we're going to see how the law uh, that Jesus puts within our hearts, because he said it will be written on your heart, thus doesn't restrict us. It gives the ability to move. And now we know how and why we can move. So here's a quick review. Most of these lessons are independent, and this one is too, but we do want to make sure that we grasp what was said about the bones and the structure before we can look at movement. And so just a quick review here for us. He says, the bones are the structure of the body. We know that. They're, they're, I don't stand without them. You don't. Uh, we can't do anything without having these rigid, hard bones in us. Truth is the structure of the church. So the truth are the bones of the church. And the core of God's structure is his law. Now, that feels awfully restrictive then all of a sudden. Ooh, start teaching about law. And Paul says, no, we've been fulfilled by the law. Why are you going there, pastor? Well, Jesus said, here's the law. Here's God's law. God's law is to love God and love others. He said, in that, all of the laws are fulfilled. So the love of God is the law. So the law of love is the frame of the body of Christ. So our frame is the law of God and in the core, in the marrow of that, if you will, that is the love of God. And then that helps us love others. And then all of a sudden, like Paul says, when he gives the fruit of the spirit against such, there, there, there's no law against those things. So as rigid and as hard as bones are, movement is impossible without them. The body of Christ cannot move into the world without the structure of God's law of love. If we're not taking in the law of love to the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbors yourself, we, we might as well just be the Red Cross or a food bank because we're only meeting physical needs. Without the law of the love of God, we will fail in meeting the spiritual needs of our community and our movements uh, will end up being fruitless if we're not taking and moving with the love of Jesus Christ. And that is his law that leads us and guides us. And it is not binding, but it sets us free. So here's where we jump in today. And you're going to think, wow, what a, what a weird switch. I go talking about movement. And I'm talking about fear and fear and movement together. Hang with us here. Stick out till the end and we'll see where we're going. Uh, what I've asked you to do, and if you had this ahead of time, that's great. If not, or if you're in a group, you can just pause it now. Don't look at these. Uh, and you can write some of these down, but write down or discuss how fear restricts movement. How does fear restrict movement? 
Okay, I want to give you just a few examples, and then you'll see where in the world uh, we're headed today. If you're claustrophobic and you just hate confined spaces, it's going to dictate where and where you'll go and where you will not go. If you have a fear of heights, that's going to dictate where. I mean, are you are you going to go? Are you going to go mountain climbing if you have a fear of heights? Are you going to do all this hiking up along these cliff edges? No, that fear is going to restrict where you go. If you have a fear of the dark, that's going to restrict you. If you see a dark room and you're not going to go in there until a light's on, that fear, these fears restrict us. Some of you might have a fear of bugs. And so when there's a bug in the room, you're not going in there until that bug is taken care of. Or you might leave the room. So our, our fears guide our movements a lot more than we would like to think they do. There are certain areas in your community you might be afraid of and so you avoid them there may be certain things certain people that kind of spook you and get you a little worried you probably avoid them and so we need to recognize our fears restrict our movements a lot more than we would like to think they do oh when i was younger i used to go and climb anywhere and then all of a sudden a few years ago i was i was in this uh uh, we were hiking with our kids and I was in this cave and I just felt like the whole thing was coming down on me and I had to get out of there. Man, ever since then, I have struggled with tight spaces. And so now I don't go into these caves when my kids are out on hiking. That fear is restricting uh, my movement. Friends, we need, to, we need to understand that our fears do restrict our movements. And sometimes if my fear fear to confront somebody might make things worse because I I need to solve a situation or maybe my fear in talking to a stranger might prevent me from being a testimony or a witness you see our fears restrict our movement our fears potentially can handicap the body of Christ and I want us to see how movement should not be restricted by fear, but these bones, these bones of love that we talked about, they free us from these fears so that we can move into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's where we go. Question two, if fear restricts movement like we've just seen, then what does God teach us about the solution to fear? And he does this in 1 John 4, 1621. So if, if our movements are restricted by fear, then what does scripture say about how to handle my fear? Here's what John tells us in his first letter. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. There's the bones, right? That's the bones of who we are. Whoever lives in in love lives in God and God in them. See how that's in us? That's our structure. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence, not fear, confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus as an unbelievable statement. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, cast it out, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. When we fear that day of judgment, then we know that that love isn't our core yet because that love cast out this fear. And as this fear is removed, movement becomes much more fluid. So what we need in the solution to our fears that are restricting our movements is the love of God in us. That's our core. That's our structure. That's our bones. And that love of God in us gives us the ability to move, therefore casting out fear. So here's kind of the logic that we're following here to answer this. God's law is the law of loving God and others. We've seen that. So this scripture tells us that love casts out fear. So if God's law is loving God and loving others, 
and love cast out fear. And we know that fear restricts us. God's law of loving frees us. So if love casts out the thing that restricts me, love frees us. So all of a sudden, my fear of approaching someone is overcome by the love that God puts in me for them. The fear of maybe teaching and using my gifts at church, or maybe it's singing, or maybe it's helping, or whatever it may be, the fears of my failing, maybe. There's a big restriction of movement, fears of failure. That fear of failing is overcome by the love of God in me to recognize that he hasn't given me my gift just for me to sit on, but it's, he's given to me to use. And it's because I love him and I love others. That love supersedes this fear. And pretty soon this fear is cast out. So God's love removes the fears that restricts us, that restrict us. Friends, this is so helpful in the fact of some of the issues and some of the concerns that we have in ministering in the body of Christ. In ministering to take the body of Christ to the world or to use our gifts in the body of Christ. The majority of time, the reason why I hear people not using their gift is because they're afraid. Well, I can't teach like that, or I can't uh, help like that, or I can't do this, or I can't do that. And it's this whole fear of this human failure that needs to be superseded by the love of God that's recognized, wow, God loves these people more than he's worried about my failure, and in him I will have strength. And so I love them enough to overcome these fears. Because I'll tell you what, I told you I was afraid I, in my senior years, I, somebody told me I'm a senior because I'm 55 now, so I can, I'll, I'll say that. Somewhere in these senior years, being over the hill, I've developed this struggle of tight spaces. But if my kids are stuck in that tight space, going to muster something in me to overcome that fear because the one that I love. And so we see people all the time overcoming their fears on behalf of somebody. Emergency. Friends, we need to recognize there is an emergency out there for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want him to cast out our fear so that we are fluid and we can move and we are no longer restricted by the fears that hold the church back because we have the structure of God's love in us. And so we go on. That's our next question. Jesus kind of summed up all of the Ten Commandments with love the, God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. He said that sums them all up. So let's go back to the Ten Commandments. How does living by the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 solve the problem of fear? This may not seem so self-evident. So I put on here for those of you studying, this is a tricky one. But Let's go and answer this. And maybe if you're watching at home, you pause and talk to it among yourselves. But here we want to look. How does the how does living according to the Ten Commandments solve the problem of fear? Well, let's look. Here's the first four commandments. The first four commandments are there's no other God. God said, I have no other gods before me. Don't make any we the old King James were graven images. Don't make any idols. And he says, Don't use my name in vain. Don't misuse my name. And then the fourth one is, remember the Sabbath day. You keep it. Make time for me. Make my time sacred. The time that you make for God needs to be sacred. Those first four commands have to do with my relationship with God. Each one of these has to do with me and God and how I'm relating to him. So because of that, when we follow these teachings and following these teachings, it allows us to move freely into his presence without fear. You see that? My restriction of getting close to God, and this is where the children of Israel were at the bottom of the mountain while Moses is on top of the mountain getting these commands. They were scared to death. They didn't want to be in the presence of God. They were afraid to be in the presence of God because they didn't know how to be in the presence of God. So when we make God the Lord of our life and there's, there's no other God before him, we worship only him. We respect and honor him by his name living and dwelling in us. 
and we keep time with God and we make time with God sacred, we now know how to be in his presence. And because we know how to be in his presence, this allows me to move freely into his presence without fear. And that's what Jesus was saying. And that's what through what John wrote in 1 John when he says we can approach that day of judgment. We can approach that judgment seat and that throne of God without fear because he's taught us how to be in his presence properly. I.e. these commands are based on loving God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. You do that. You take care of the first four commandments. Perfect love cast out fear. I can now have this relationship with God and I don't wake up in the morning afraid of God or what he's going to do to me. And I don't go to bed at night afraid of what might happen because God is my Lord and I have overcome fear because I love the Lord with all my heart. And this love cast out fear, allowing me to move fluidly into his presence. So that's how the first part of the Ten Commandments cast out fear. And when that fear's gone, my movement is no longer restricted. Second part of the Ten Commandments, the last six commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. This is all about loving God. This is all about loving your neighbor. These commands are based on love your neighbor. And do you realize that when you follow these teachings, these teachings allow us to move freely in society, and I should have put the word fear on there, without fear. This is, a, this is an amazing thought. Because we live in a world where our doors are locked, uh, there's... There's curfews in certain regions of, of our towns or our worlds. Uh, there's all of these things that create all this fear. We've got insurance. We've got everything else to try to keep us safe. In fact, I want to suggest to you that today in 20th century, 21st century United States, 2020, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. We live in a culture that is a fear of risk. We take no risk and everything's got a warning on it. You can't do this. You can't do that because we have all of these fears. Well, there's something bad happened to them. It may happen to me. So therefore, I won't drink this. I won't do that. I won't go there. I won't. And all of these fears govern our lives. Do you realize if everybody that you knew and everybody in your neighborhood followed these things, there wouldn't be any such thing as a lock on a door. There wouldn't be any such thing as jealousy as we, I wouldn't fear for my life. I wouldn't fear for my family. I wouldn't fear for my stuff. I wouldn't fear for the truth. Friends, if we live in a culture where everybody does, does this, we now can move in society without fear. But because people murder, because people steal, because people commit adultery, because people lie, because people covet, because people don't honor one another, they don't honor family, they don't honor, that has created a society full of fears. You know what fears do? Fears create more laws to try to protect from the things that we're afraid of. That's why Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light because his law is love your neighbor. See, these teachings are all based on the fact that we should love our neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we're loving God, loving our neighbor, that gives us the ability to put down these fears and to move freely into God's presence and in a society. And friends, we live in a society that does not follow these things. Ever since Jesus Christ, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, we've now had a society that does not follow these things. And they have brought nothing but fear. And that's what sin does. And these laws give us the power to overcome sin so that we can live in relationship with God and with others without fear. And when that fear is removed and love dominates, 
the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes fluid. We're struggling in our world right now with how attractive or unattractive unbelievers see church. If you and I commit to this, to loving God and loving our neighbor, you will be an amazingly attractive ambassador of the kingdom of God. Because it is done in his power and his strength without fear. And they no longer have to fear the church because we're loving our neighbor. The movement of the church is based on the bones and the structure, which is the love of God. And that leads us to our last question of this session, which now is a fairly obvious question. Do God's commands restrict movement or enable movement? Those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord are going to say that the commands of God restrict movement because they haven't met the law of love. And those who have the law of love as the structure of their life and the structure of their community, meaning the body of Christ, it enables movement. Perfect love cast out fear and that enables movement. Friends, we must not compromise the structure that God has given us in Scripture because when that compromise is made, the compromise of His truth and all of His standards and all of His love, when that is compromised, movement is restricted. It's a broken bone. And when my bones are broken, my movement is much more restricted. But when those bones are strong and steady because I am not compromising them and I am not trying to bend them and I'm not trying to twist them and trying to make them fit what I want them to do, but rather I let them do what they're intended to do, that enables me to move and to move at the pace that God asks us to move. Friends, we need his strength. We need his truth. We need his structure because we need to be moving. I need to move closer to God and I need to move the gospel of Jesus Christ into this world. And so do you. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I pray that these have been a help to you in your own walk and your own journey with Christ. Next week, we're going to hit lesson seven out of nine, and it's going to be about growth. And it's not just our personal growth we're going to focus on. We need to focus on growth of the body of Christ. And it's much more important than just numeric numbers, friends. So that's what we're going to dive into next week. So I hope these are a strength to you. Continue to follow us online. The study guides will be there. And we're thankful for everybody that can participate in these Bible studies. God bless you. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you next week.